Good afternoon and welcome to Learn at Home with BIA. My name is Alexandra Konsa-Grushinsky from NEIU 19 and I am the STEM Services Coordinator. Today we're going to be learning about how to turn salty water into fresh water by a process called desalination. So here we are. So there are a few things that we need to talk about before we begin. The first is why would we need to know how to turn salty water into fresh water? But before we even talk about that, we're gonna be throwing around some vocabulary terms for this lesson. And I wanna make sure that everybody is on the same page. So the first term that we're gonna talk about is actually on the next slide. And that is saline. So you may have heard of the word saline. You may have seen it in the drugstore selling of saline solution. You may have seen it on an ingredients list, or you may have heard it in school. And so saline actually refers to a solution that has salt of some kind in it. So the most simple saline solution which is a tongue twister, the most simple saline solution is salt and water. So if I took table salt, the salt that you might use to season your food, and I added it to water, and I stirred and stirred and stirred the water until all of the salt dissolved, and I couldn't see it anymore, and all I could see was water, that would be a saline solution. And so we need to understand what a saline solution is, because when we are going to take the salt out of water or out of that solution, we need to understand how the salt got in the water in the first place. So that those two things together is a saline solution. <coughs> the next uh, vocabulary word is salinity. Salinity refers to the amount of salt in a solution. So how much salt is dissolved in that solution? So if we look at the, the little bit of salt here on the left, if I were to dissolve that into a small amount of water, it would have a certain salinity and they measure that in parts per million. But if I took this whole bowl of salt and I dissolved it in the same amount of water, it would have a greater amount of salinity. There'd be more salt to the water ratio. So more salt, greater percentage of the solution would be salt. That's its salinity. The next vocabulary term is called desalination. So desalination, if you're familiar with D, as in to undo something, right? So delete, right, would be an example of that. Uh, desalination is the process of taking a saline solution, so a maybe a salt water mixture uh, that has been dissolved, right, and taking the salt out of that solution. That's desalination. And the last vocabulary word is still. And a still refers to any kind of mechanism that allows us to take out something that's dissolved in a liquid and separate it from that liquid. So that's why they call it distilled water. That's water that's been through a still and they've taken uh, items out of it, dissolved items out of it. And so we're going to use a homemade still. We're going to learn how to make one and use one. And you can do this at home. And we are going to use this still to desalinate a salt and water mixture. So now we know our vocabulary terms. The next question that I think we should be asking is why should we know this? Why is this important for us to know as kids? As, as teenagers, as um, people who want to know these things. Well, a couple of facts. One, the planet, our planet, Earth, is covered in water. A large percentage of it is covered in water. But that water is ocean water. And that water can't be used for drinking because it contains, among other things, salt. And we already know that um, human beings can't drink salt water and survive. And if you didn't know that, now you do. You can't drink ocean water and expect to survive because human beings can't have all of that salt in their diet. It does really terrible things to us uh, and we, we can die from it. 
Uh, so we have to drink water that doesn't have salt in it. And even though here in the United States, we don't talk very much about having safe drinking water because most of us know that we can walk up to our sink and turn on the tap and water will come out and that water will be safe for us to drink. Um, but in lots of other places in the world, safe drinking water isn't that simple. And there are uh, limits on the amount of safe water that's available. In some cases, there might not be safe water available, but in some cases, there's a ton of salt water available. And so human beings, especially in those arid regions, so those regions that are very dry, like desert regions of the world, have developed a way to take salt out of ocean water so that we can turn it into drinking water. And we know that what is the vocab term? Desalination is that word that we're going to take the salt out of the water, right? So how salty is the ocean anyway? How much salt do we take out of the ocean uh, to make it safe drinking water? So uh, most ocean water contains what we call 35,000 parts per million, that's the PPM after the 35,000, of salt. That means for every millionth million piece of water, there are 35,000 uh, millions of salt. Um, and so that, that's pretty salty, right? Um, and so it is the single largest water resource that we have on this planet, but it's salty, so we need to take the salt out of it. So how have we developed, what kind of technologies have humans developed to take seawater, which is salty, and to convert it into drinking water? Well, we have uh, three methods that we use most often. The first is solar desalination, which is what we're going to learn how to make and do today. There is something called powered desalination, and there's something called reverse osmosis. And so this diagram describes uh, how you would do a solar desalination experiment or how you would do that as a mechanism. So if we look at this diagram, we see the sun, which is the solar part of the, of the program, of the mechanism. And we see that there is a tank of seawater that's kind of been buried in uh, the soil. And as the sun beats down on the seawater, it begins to evaporate. And as that evaporation occurs, it forms steam. And that steam is the gaseous version of water. And it rises up, just like steam rises up from a pot of water that's boiling. And it falls through the pipe, or it moves through the pipe. And the pipe is angled in such a way that it goes back down into the ground. So if you can imagine this steam going up, evaporation, crossing across the pipe and then coming back down, as that steam hits the uh, cooler portion of the pipe that's underground, it's going to start to condense. And that condensation is gonna run down the sides of this pipe and gonna end up in the bottom of where it's being angled into, and that's gonna be a reservoir of fresh water. And so that's how that works. And we're actually going to do this experiment. We're gonna build one of these at home with stuff you can find in your house. Um, powered desalination refers to replacing the solar or the sun as the method of creating this evaporation with some other type of uh, mechanism. So we can use electricity, I mentioned earlier, you can put a pot of water on the stove and boil it. That is one way of creating uh, a desalination uh, machine. And so you can replace the power of the sun with the power of just about anything. You need to make the water into steam, and that's step one. So if you have the way to do that, then you have uh, desalination uh, still. And then the last one that I wanted to talk about is something called reverse osmosis. Now, reverse osmosis is a huge uh, machine that we use typically to create large amounts of fresh water from seawater for uh, enough to provide uh, drinking water for an entire town or entire city. And so these are massive operations that cycle through thousands and thousands and thousands of gallons of seawater and turn them into drinking water every day. And these plants are, are huge. Um, we don't see many of them 
uh, locally in this area because we don't typically use salt water and turn it into drinking water because we have plentiful groundwater here in Pennsylvania, but in other places where they're closer to the coast and where they need to get that drinking water from the ocean, these huge reverse osmosis plants are in operation. So we are going to create a solar desalination experiment. We're gonna use the sun to aid in the evaporation process. And we are going to use uh, things that you can find in your own home. So let me talk about the things that you're gonna to need to gather in order to do this experiment. The first is a glass bowl. Now this glass bowl has to be large enough that you can fit a mug inside of it. And the idea is, is that the glass bowl should be big enough that the mug can go in, like I said before, but you also want to have, when you look at the top level of the mug and the top lip of the bowl, they should be either even with one another or the bowl should be higher. So it should be a bigger bowl and that is higher than the mug or it should be even. What you don't want to see is you don't want to see a mug that's taller than the bowl. So make sure that you pick the right size. Then you're going to need cling wrap, which is plastic wrap or saran wrap, as the case may be. And you're going to need a piece of that that's big enough to go over the mug and the bowl all together and come down the sides a little bit. You're going to need access to fresh water, and tap water is just fine. You're going to need salt. Any kind of salt that you might use on your food is perfect. You're going to need a spoon, and you're going to need a small weighted object. And that weighted object can be anything from a marble, a bottle cap, an eraser, a small um, piece of Lego, or a uh, micro, micro car, a little toy car, wh whatever you have. It needs to be small and it needs to have a little bit of weight. It should be small enough that if you wanted, want to put it in the mug that it would fit down in the mug very easily. And so that is going to be what we're going to use for our experiment. And so our next step is to go to my kitchen where I'm going to show you how we're going to set up this experiment. So I will see you there. So in order to desalinate water, like creating ocean water safe for drinking, in our house we have to make water that's salty first, So, because most of us don't have access to seawater. So seawater is essentially salt and water, it's got salinity, it's salty. So what you would have to do is you'd have to take salt, if you had salt in your house, and take a spoon and put it into some, some water, and I recommend water that's a little bit warm because um, the salt will melt a little bit easier. So I have a measuring cup here and I have um, one and a half cups of warm water in it right out of the tap. And I also have a big glass bowl and I have a mug and I have some cling wrap here. I have a bottle cap or something with a little bit of weight. I have salt and I also have a spoon. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take my one and a half cups of water and I'm gonna take my salt and I'm going to put in one spoonful of salt into the water, okay? And it doesn't have to be exact, but I'm gonna put it into the water and I'm gonna stir it until the salt disappears. It'll get a little cloudy for a while, but that's okay. You wanna stir it until you don't hear the grit under the spoon anymore. That means that the salt is melted. So this is going to be our seawater. So we're going, our experiment is to take the salt now, we've put it in the water, now we wanna make this salt water uh, just, uh, good for drinking again because that's very salty. So we're going to take this and we're going to put it in the mug, or not in the mug, in the bowl. And we're going to pour it until it's just about an inch of salt water in the bowl, so not too high. We might use all of it and we might not, depending on the size of your bowl. And then you take your empty mug and you put it in the bowl, right in the bottom of the bowl, and it's gonna touch the bottom of the bowl, but see how the water is all around it? So that's salt water all around it. And then you're gonna take your piece of cling wrap. I'm gonna move this over. You're gonna take your piece of cling wrap and, or saran wrap, sometimes people call it, and you're going to lay this across the bowl like this. You're going to put it across the bowl like this and the idea is that 
we're going to take this outside and we're going to make it con make condensation. So notice how the middle of this here is where our mug is. We want to encourage any condensation, any evaporation that happens inside the bowl is going to go up into the air and it's going to become vapor like steam. And then that vapor is going to condense when it hits this plastic wrap. So it's going to make little droplets of steam along the plastic wrap. And what we want to do is we want to want to make the plastic wrap really tight. See how it's already starting to fog up? That's perfect. And we are going to encourage the little droplets that collect on the, the plastic wrap to go down into the cup. We don't want it to go back down into the salt water because then we're not making unsalty water. We're just putting that salt back into the water. So we want to take our little weight, and it could be a marble, it could be a Lego, it could be a little little uh, matchbox car, whatever you have that has a little bit of weight. And you want to put it in the middle right here, and you want to weight it down so that it sags a little in the middle. See how it sags? And then that is going to encourage any condensation that happens to run towards the middle and into the mug. Okay, so now we gotta take this thing outside. So here we are in my backyard and my solar still has been sitting out here and working for a couple of hours now. And you'll notice that there are tiny little beads of condensation on the inside of the plastic wrap. These little beads of condensation are going to run down into the mug and inside that mug is going to be fresh unsalty water. So we're going to leave this out here for a little bit longer. We're going to see what we have. Okay. Okay, so I went out to my backyard. It's been several hours in the sun and I brought my now very warm glass bowl back into the house and now we were going to see if we have created any fresh water in our still. Remember the water on the outside of the bowl was salty and the condensation here is not because the idea was that it evaporated and it left the salt behind and then as it runs down because of our weight as it runs down these see the little streaks that have been created by our little water droplets it runs down into the cup and then in the cup is going to be not salty water it's going to be fresh water so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take my weight and I'm going to take it off my plastic wrap and then I'm going to very carefully peel my plastic wrap off and I'm going to kind of shake it a little bit towards the center to try to encourage those little water droplets see those little water droplets there's one right there I'm going to encourage those water droplets to actually drip into the center. So see my little water droplets? I'm going to shake them. I can get them to drop in the center there. And I'm going to do this side. And that water is going to drop into the center. I don't know if you can see those little water droplets. They're going down in there. Okay. See, look at all the water on that side. Okay. And so now... I have a little bit of water left out here. I'm gonna jiggle it a little bit so you can see. But guess what? I have some water in here now. Look at that. I don't know if you can see it. But there's water in that cup now. And so that water should be fresh water. I'm gonna stick my finger in it to see. Yeah, not salty at all. Isn't that awesome? So you can try this experiment at home. If you don't have a backyard and you don't have um, a spot to put it, you can put it on a back deck, you can put it on the driveway, you can also put it on uh, the other side of a sunny window. So you can stick this on a windowsill where sun's coming in and it will work as well. And your patience will be rewarded. Well, thank you for joining me this afternoon for Learn at Home with VIA and we'll see you next time. Cheers. I was working for a nonprofit organization known as the Pennsylvania Environmental Council, and they had a regional office here in Wilkes-Barre. We were able to pull together a regional conference 
on abandoned mine reclamation in the summer of 1996 that helped to sort of facilitate and charter the formation of the Eastern Coalition for Abandoned Mine Reclamation. EPCAMR and the Western Pennsylvania organization WEPCAMR are vital resources for the groups who make up the environmental community. Assisted by community leaders, local conservation districts, and representatives from the coal and cogen industries, they supply critically needed information. Give them what they need and to make it easier for them. And I think that's what EPCAMR's charge is and that's what WIPCAMR's charge is to get the work on the ground. This mine drainage is flowing from what we call locally the honeypot mine shaft or the Susquehanna number no. seven air shaft discharge. What's flowing is about a 2,000 gallon per minute discharge of mine drainage, 20 to 30 parts iron that's contaminated in this particular reach before it comes into confluence with the Newport Creek. Discharges like this one stain the landscape throughout the Pennsylvania coal region. For every orange stream we can see, there are miles of abandoned mine shafts we cannot. Enumerating them may seem impossible, but tools for the job may already be at our fingertips. Utilizing existing resources and tapping the institutional knowledge of former coal miners and by looking at those maps from the coal companies, from the second geologic survey maps, from the federal government's Office of Surface Mining folio maps, we can then determine what the level of the water is in the mines. We might be better able to treat the water by helping to utilize some of those resources. These documents of Pennsylvania's coal mining history are a Rosetta Stone for deciphering our subterranean makeup, a way to use our heritage to shine a light on future environmental progress. Not only does it give us the underground geology and the structural geology of the coal that's been mined out, it shows us the flow patterns of the water weaving its way underneath the ground to get to lower elevations and to these discharge points. What we've been able to do is transform a lot of the two-dimensional maps into a three-dimensional format. EPCAMR utilizes computer software to map the hydrogeology of flooded underground mines, presenting a perspective never before possible, even when men viewed these mines with their own eyes. So many people in not only the Wyoming Valley, but throughout our region, just don't realize that the water is flowing right beneath their feet in some instances. And uh, this could help us predictively determine if there is potential for subsidence. We did a conference one time, and the theme of the conference was, what color is your watershed? The majority of those streams that you're gonna see are this particular color of yellow boy, orange, we relate, when we talk to kids, it's no different than if you left your bike out at night. We ask them what it's got on it, it's got rust. It's land availability that we need and settle in in detention time to allow water like this to have this iron oxide, not deposit in the channel, but put it into a system that would allow that iron to collect in a way that we can harvest it. One of the things that EPCAMRA does on a very small scale is to process and dry this by the five gallon bucket loads so that we can sell it to other manufacturers that might want to use it for wood stains, for trail markers and kiosks. You can actually reuse this stuff right back in the community that it came from. We would love to see larger companies come in and create these type of jobs that are green, but they're really orange, and they could be harvesting a lot of this iron oxide for a productive value. If we can change the way we see the environmental conditions around us, we may find that the legacy handed down to us by our industrial forebears is changeable as well. I was born and raised here in the Wildman Valley, seen these streams since I was three or four years old. We found not only through working with our local elementary schools and our high schools, some of the myths that are out there and some of the just misconceptions that you can't take care of this type of problem it's a mindset that we're trying to change. We have this place-based philosophy that teaches the kids about the history within their own school district. They don't have to go far. They can go two miles and be at this stream or uh, incorporate some type of environmental skits into learning about what this is instead of just ignoring it. And they'll know by the time they're done with us what the name of this stream is, what the mine discharge is, what coal colliery operated here where their grandfather probably worked. Turn around that, that apathy that they may have had or that 
negative attitude towards the streams, see them for their future productive value, we can get those students and teachers to be uh, part of the solution.